The next speaker is uh, Professor Christopher Knittel. He's the William Barton Rogers Professor of Energy Economics in the S MIT Sloan School of Management. His work focuses on environmental economics, industrial organization, and applied um, econometrics. And today, Chris's topic is solving the energy conundrum. Chris? I have no control. Oh, there, there it goes. Uh, I just work here. I, uh, so as was mentioned, I'm an economist. Um, my work focuses on environmental economics. Um, I want to thank the organizers for having me here today, although judging by your reaction to President Reif's uh, uh, bringing up economics, I'm not quite sure you feel the same way as I do. Um, but with that said, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change and what's unique about climate change um, relative to other environmental issues of our time and, and why that creates uh, difficulties with solving, solving climate change. Um, this title, the title was sort of given to me, um, by solving the energy conundrum. Um, I must admit, as you might know, economics is known as the dismal science, so this is much too optimistic for an economist uh, to come up with. My titles were more along the lines of, never mind, um, <laughs> you know, let's just give up now. Um, but so, so to make it as optimistic as possible, I'll just add a question mark, and then we could go on from there. Um, but again, I, so I want to focus on what's, what's unique about climate change. And then, and then after that, I want to talk about what policy prescriptions are needed uh, for us to actually solve, solve climate change or have a real uh, dent. We're not going to solve climate change. It's going to change. T global temperatures are going to increase. But at least we can uh, reduce the impact of climate change in some, at some degree. So what is unique about climate change is, is really creates, and, and pun intended here, really creates a climate of inaction. Um, that is that policymakers and countries more generally um, have a big incentive not to do anything, even large countries like the US. Um, so solving climate change through policy is really going really to require solving that or fixing that climate of inaction. Um, and that's going to require some work. Um, so what's unique about climate change? Well, the first thing is that greenhouse gases are a global pollutant. Unlike just about every other environmental issue of our time, those issues were local. And, and local communities or, uh, could have a big impact on the costs of those, of those environmental problems. When I emit a ton of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that impacts the entire world. Uh, it, it doesn't just impact my uh, my constituents. C contrast that with things like sulfur dioxide that cause acid rain, particulate matter, or smog. Those impacts of, of those, uh, that pollution is local. So if I reduce the sources of that pollution, I have local benefits. And the, and the benefits of my costs, if I, if I uh, take some action, which is costly, and, and it leads to a reduction of sulfur dioxide, the benefits of, those, of that accrues to me. Whereas with, with greenhouse gas emissions, if the United States reduces its greenhouse gas emissions, it benefits everyone. There will be some benefits that accrue to the US, but the vast majority of those benefits will actually go globally. So you're asking me to take some costly action to reduce, to, to benefit other countries. And that, that in and of itself, uh, creates a climate of inaction. Even, even so things like uh, nitrogen oxides, which, which cause a precursor to smog, we do understand that some of the, the winds blow those to other communities. But even local cities, Los Angeles has an incentive to reduce its nitrogen oxide emissions. Even though some of those benefits are going to accrue to surrounding towns, the, the majority of those are going to stay local. And, and that's going to create an, an incentive for, for Los Angeles to do something. California, if we go a little bit broader in terms of geographic scope, 
even if the benefits aren't isolated to Los Angeles, they're probably isolated to California. So now California has an incentive to do something. Even if some of those benefits go to Arizona, they're, they're all within the US borders, so now the country has an incentive to do something. That's, that's vastly different for greenhouse gas emissions. And that creates an incentive to free ride. Every country wants all the other countries to do something while doing, what, what they're, while, while doing business as usual in their country. The other aspect of that is, is that every single country is a small part of the problem. So even if the US were to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by half, and nobody thinks that that's attainable in the next, cent uh, next decade, or, at least, it's not going to have a, much of, you know, it's not going to have a huge impact on climate change. So put those two things together, and you have a classic example of economics, which is called the, the tragedy of the commons. That is, there's a common pool here, the atmosphere, and everyone has an incentive to do what they would do ignoring climate change and hope everyone else does, does something about it. And of course, when you put that together, no one does anything, and we just have climate change. If we look at how the US compares and even how the, the developed world compares in terms of their relative greenhouse gas emissions, you can see that the first thing you, you realize is that if we're going to do anything in terms of reducing climate change, the impacts of climate change, China's going to have to move. So this is just uh, four groups of countries, or sets of countries. We have the US in blue, uh, the developed, the rest of the OECD in green, and then we see China in red. And the, the uh, orange is the rest of the world outside of those groups. So the US and Europe, essentially, are becoming less and less important in this decision. And in order to have a real impact, we're going to have to convince China. And going out to 2035, we're going to have to convince the rest of the world as well once they start to actually be more important than China. So now you're asking developing countries that aren't as wealthy as us to actually take costly actions to to not necessarily benefit themselves, but benefit the globe. And you can see how that becomes very, very dismal um, and creates this climate of inaction. The second unique aspect of climate change is that not all, but most of the damages are way out in the future. So you're asking current generations to take costly actions to benefit future generations. And of course, it's really easy to ignore future generations because they're not at the negotiating table. Right? Um, now, I love my son, but um, that, you know, that link is not, not enough for everyone to sort of equate his costs, the costs of climate change that are going to be borne by him, uh, with, with my own. So that also creates a, a climate of, of inaction. Third. And this might be even the most important one, is that there's no smoking gun with climate change. Um, of course, we, get, we have our models that can, that, that can create links between greenhouse gas emissions and natural disasters, which then lead to, to costly uh, costs borne by, by, by civilization. But contrast that with other pollutants more local pollutants, like smog or particulate matter. When, when, when you bring up smog or particulate matter to me, I, I have this in, picture in my mind. Right? That's a smoking gun. We, we, we know that smog and particulate matter is causing that lady to wear that mask um, and is causing uh, visibility to be only 10 feet. When I think about acid rain, the picture that pops into my mind is this one. We know sulfur dioxide goes into the atmosphere, comes down as acid rain, and kills, kills fish and has other damages. When I think about industrial waste, the, being a, a Pittsburgh Steeler fan, I think of rivers that catch on fire. <laughs> right? um, I'm a fan from afar because of things like this. When I think of oil spills, of course, we think of issue, pictures like this, right? 
Then we get to climate change. Well, when I think about climate change and what picture pops into my mind, something like this. Yeah. <laughs> right. Where we're, we're talking about 2100, right? Um, so we're talking about some climate model that tells me where temperatures are going to change. And, uh, but I don't have a picture of a hurricane there. Or I don't have a picture of an of a, uh, oil-covered uh, bird, if that's indeed what it was. Um, so where do we go from here? So how do we solve this? So I was asked to solve this problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, might be much easier to talk about a new capital campaign or something like that. But um, <laughs> solving climate changes might be a little bit more difficult. Um, so I think one of the things you might notice in the political arena, at least, is, is that the focus is starting to shift on near-term impacts of climate change. And I think that's, that's the right way to go, right? just from a PR campaign in the sense that, again, near-term costs are what resonate. Uh, it's, it's, very diff or it's very easy to ignore you know, costs of, of $1.5 trillion that are going to come 100 years from now. But, w but if we can, the more we can link current natural disasters to climate change, the, the, the more this issue is going to resonate with the, with the general public. The second is that we need China to move, obviously. And China's not going to move until we move. And the U.S. has really done nothing in terms of climate change. Um, Europe has, has done quite a bit. Countries like Australia, New Zealand, even Canada, even British Columbia has a, a carbon tax. The U.S. has done very little. That hopefully is changing. So just last week, uh, the EPA announced uh, new proposed rules that will cut greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions from the current fleet of, of power plants by 30%. Um, by 20, 2030, 30% below 2005. This is not enough. I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that. 30% um, below 2005 levels is actually just about an 8% reduction from business as usual. So we're not doing, you know, the, the headline looks like we're doing a lot more, but at least we're doing something, right? We haven't, we've done nothing uh, since then. We've done some in transportation, but, but not really. So this, I think this, the biggest impact this will have is at the negotiating tables in the international agreements, that at least the Obama administration or, or the next administration can point to the U.S. moving on climate change. And that, that could at least serve as an example, potentially, for China. Even the, Europe has, has been an example for, for quite a long time. The EPA was smart in, in, in leaving it up to the states to decide what policies they're going to put in place to, to, to achieve this reduction. Um, and I'll get back to sort of what policies I hope, I hope they put in place in, in a moment. So this, this new bill, or these new proposed rules, I should say, um, are, are taking on the, the, the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the US, at least, and that's electricity, which uh, which uh, accounts for about one one third of, of all all emissions. Um, so uh, again, it's not enough, but it's a great first step, um, and 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 I think it'll have a big impact in, in in upcoming international negotiations. So how do we get there? So how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? So there's lots of policy options, uh, and this is where sort of the devil's in the detail in terms of how costly it'll be to to to. Uh, get these reductions. So economists, almost unanimously, and, and as you might, you know, the, the joke is that if you line up economists end to end, 10 economists end to end, they'll all be pointing in different directions, right? <laughs> um, there's one issue where we agree, just one, I think, and, and that is what is the most efficient way to reduce pollution? And that is to put a price on it. What is the fundamental pro problem of greenhouse gas emissions? It's free to put them in the atmosphere. It doesn't cost companies or you and I anything when we, when, when we burn a gallon of gasoline. The most efficient way to reduce the consumption of something is to raise its price. 
and the current price of greenhouse gas emissions, at least in the US, is zero, so we need to put a price on that. And we can do that in one of two ways. One is a carbon tax, which is a nice direct way to do it. As I mentioned, British Columbia taxes uh, CO2 by $35 a ton. Um, so if you burn a gallon of gasoline, which, which emits or accounts for about 20 pounds of greenhouse gas emissions, you pay for, for that through the carbon tax. A very close co cousin to a, a carbon tax would be a cap and trade system, um, where instead of taxing the product, you, you give out a bunch of permits that allows the holder of the permit to release greenhouse gas emissions in, into the atmosphere. Those permits are traded in the economy, and the price of those permits becomes the carbon tax. So if permits are trading for $30 a ton, that's equivalent to a $30 a ton carbon tax. The beauty of a cap and trade system, from a political perspective, is that the government gets to decide who's, who gets those permits. And the permits are actually just tax revenue. Right? So, so if I hold a, a permit that allows me to release a ton of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, and those permits are trading for $30 a ton, which I just said was equivalent to a $30 a ton carbon tax, I, abate, I basically have $30 of tax revenue in my pocket. So in a cap and trade system, you can give those permits to the firm, and that's basically giving tax revenue before the tax revenue is ever collected. So from a political standpoint, you can get a lot more buy-in from those that would have, have ultimately paid the carbon tax by giving them the, ta by giving them the tax revenue ahead of, ahead of time. Cap and trade was actually started under a Republican administration, under George Bush Sr., and has always been hailed by Republicans as the most efficient way to reduce, reduce pollution. It was used in sulfur dioxide. It's been used in nitrogen oxides. Only recently has the Republican Party sort of vilified cap and trade. Um, and we hope, as economists, to undo, the, undo that. Because again, it is a more politically pa palatable way to, to have pollution taxes. Instead, what we tend to rely on in the US are other policies that aren't as efficient as cap and trade or, or carbon taxes. And, and those are things like cafe standards, which, which regulate the average fuel economy of uh, automobile manufacturers or renewable portfolio standards, which regulate the average amount of electricity coming from solar and wind for electricity providers. Or we have things like the renewable fuel standard, which essentially forces a certain number of gallons of ethanol into the economy. We rely on those, we believe, as economists, because they hide the cost, the true cost of those policies. There's not a number that you could point to how costly is cap, are CAFE standards, how costly are renewable portfolio standards. There's not a number that you could point to like a carbon tax where it's $30 a ton or a cap and trade system where permits are $30 a ton. In both of those systems, you could point to the cost of the policy. Here, it's hidden. But work that I've done and lots and lots of economists have done in in comparing the costs of those alternative policies to actual pollution taxes, suggest that these alternative policies are three to 10 times more expensive. That is, to get the same reduction in whether it's greenhouse gas emissions, nitrogen oxides, you're paying up to 10 times more to get that, that same reduction as you would if you just instituted a carbon tax. And that's the most frustrating thing about being an economist in this arena is that we know the right answer. We know how to do this. These are called Paguvian taxes, named after probably some guy named P Pagu. Um, <laughs> that article was published in 1920, so we know for about 90 years, we, or over 90 years, we've, we've known how to do this, but nobody will listen. Okay? Just like nobody's listening to many scientists that are saying the climate is changing. So there's a lot of frustration going around here. And the, the other nice thing about carbon taxes, at least, and you could get to this with cap and trade if you do it correctly, is that you could use the tax revenues to reduce taxes that we don't like, to reduce taxes that economists know are actually bad for the economy. Imagine 
what we would call a revenue neutral carbon tax, where all the money collected under the carbon tax went to reduce income taxes or sales taxes or other taxes that actually put a drain on the economy. So you get this sort of double dividend, people have called it. Um, and I hope, or I believe this is where we're going to get the Republicans on board here, is that if we link it together with reductions in other taxes that are even more vilified, um, that we, we, might, we might get some buy-in there. The fundamental problem with climate change, with greenhouse gas emissions, are fossil fuels are cheap. Not only are they cheap, but they're just beautiful. Right? A gallon of gasoline, the energy density in a gallon of gasoline is remarkable. If you were to design from the bottom up the perfect fuel to run cars on, it would probably be gasoline. Right? It's dense, it, it, it's, you can pipe it, there's, there's, there's all sorts of benefits. Even now, if you look at, so this is the cost of generating electricity from, others, from all sorts of sources. An existing coal-fired power plant costs 3.2 cents a kilowatt hour. A new nuclear plant, if you don't have cost overruns, like Southern Company are, are experiencing now, are on the order of 11 cents a kilowatt hour. You, you like your solar PV? Well, the one issue with solar PV is, is that it's expensive and it's also intermittent, that you can't control when the electricity comes from, comes from it. So not only do you, when you put a panel on your roof, you, Somebody has to, in the system somewhere, put a, a natural gas plant to sort of be there waiting, waiting to fill in the electricity that you didn't generate once the clouds covered the, the sun. So when you add up all those costs, that's 11 cents a kilowatt hour. So this is the problem. The, the sources of, of electricity and the sources of fuel that we use that emit greenhouse gas emissions are cheap. How do you solve that? You make them more expensive. And that's exactly what a carbon tax or a cap and tra trade system would do. The other key component here is that innovation plays a much larger role um, in climate change. Because we're gonna, we have to incentivize China to do something. Well, the way to do that is to make alternative low carbon technologies cheaper than the high carbon technologies. And that's going to come from innovation. Right? And a carbon tax or a cap and trade system would incentivize more innovation because in, we innovate on things that are expensive. We, we innovate on, on reducing the costs of things that are expensive. So once carbon is expensive, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have this incentive uh, to do more innovation. So what is the roadmap? I have already mentioned this, and they're going to start throwing things at me in a second. But, um, it starts with US and European leadership. The US hasn't led, but I think we're, we're starting to see that. And we need more and more innovation. And this is where places like MIT become even more important. If you look at all the innovation that's happening, we've had a lot of innovation on the oil and natural gas side. Why? Because those fossil fuels are expensive. Um, so once we put in place the right incentives, um, we'll, get, we'll get that innovation. Just let me end with the final note here, which is it's time that you guys start getting angry, right? And actually writing your congressmen, <laughs> writing your politicians and telling them that you're not gonna buy this BS, right? Here's a recent quote from an unnamed presidential hopeful from Florida. Um, <laughs> says, I do not believe that human activity is causing these dramatic changes, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that policymakers can say that and still, have, still be a presidential hopeful is mind-boggling. Right? We need to start calling these policymakers out. Right? And I think that starts with alums. <laughs> that, that quote is devaluing you, right? What do you, you are scientists. You came to the best scientific university in the world. It's devaluing what we do. And that's a recipe for disaster. If it's, if it's not climate change, it's gonna be something else. And at some point, we're gonna be ignored completely. So let me just end with a photo of what I, uh, a picture I took this morning, which is my license plate. <laughs> uh,
Thank you.